Hello, everybody. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Catherine Blackburn and welcome her back to the Textile Museum. I was delighted to work with Catherine previously in 2016 when we were fortunate to include her work, Ties That Bind, in the exhibition Worlds on a String, Beads, Journeys, Inspirations. And more recently, in 2019, curator Far Youssef was here, featured her works Trapline and Aboriginal Classics in the exhibition Wild. Catherine is also the 2018 winner of the museum's Melissa Levin Emerging Artist Award. Catherine was born in Paituanak, Saskatchewan, of Denny and Ans European ancestry, and is a member of the English River First Nation. She's a multidisciplinary artist and jeweler whose common themes address Canada's colonial past that are often prompted by personal narratives. Her work merges mixed media and fashion to create dialogue between historical art forms and new interpretations of them. Through utilizing beadwork and other historical adornment techniques in her practice, she explores Indigenous sovereignty, decolonization, and representation. Her work has been exhibited in notable national and international exhibitions and fashion runways, including at the Daquane Continuous Fire, National Gallery of Canada, Santa Fe Haute Couture Fashion Show, New Mexico, and Radical Stitch, the Mackenzie Art Gallery. She has received numerous grants and awards for her work, including the Saskatchewan RBC Emerging Artist Award, publications in Vogue and in Style magazines, her inclusion on the 2019 Sobe Art, Art Award Long List, the prestigious Edeljorg Edeljorg Contemporary Art Fellowship, and most recently was one of six Forge Project Fellows. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you all for coming. Eklanete, um, hello, my name is Catherine Blackburn. I'm from English River First Nation and was born in Patchnack, Saskatchewan. Um, I didn't grow up in my community, however. I grew up in rural Saskatchewan in a community called Choiceland. And I'm currently based in Terrace, BC. I don't know if you're familiar, but it's an uh, interior northern boat, an hour and a half east of Prince Rupert, so somewhat coastal in a way. Um, and I'm currently on the homelands of, in the unceded territory of the Simshan people. So I think I'm just gonna dive right into it. I have quite a few slides to show. So through, through our hands, by way of beading, gathering, speaking, tattooing, piercing, trapping, fishing, tool making, sewing, skinning, scraping, tanning, I honor the ways in which Dene life has always relied on our bodies, how our bodies have provided and protected, and how our hands have always held immense love for one another. The common threads uh, throughout my practice stitch together stories, perspectives, and histories while challenging myself to create work that speaks to a continuum and imagine futures. My practice is deeply rooted in matriarchy and the indigenous feminine, celebrating and honoring my grandmother, my late grandmother, and her knowledge of garment making and adornment is one way I am rooted in this power. You can see her there, she was a little bit younger, um, surrounded by all of her works. She'd always be making, always creating, always beading when I'd go up for visits, and she gifted nearly everything she made to grandkids and um, her sons and daughters and great grandkids. So we all have some kind of piece of grandma's, if not multiple, um, that we treasure. I think about how my hands hold knowledge. Through stitch work, I explore how my hands hold deep love and also deep resistance, and how mark making describes permanency and presence. These historical art forms and lab labors of stitch work, including tattooing, are undergoing a resurgence and revitalization. This revitalization is directly linked to indigenous silencing and erasure. These are tattoos on my own hands. Um, they were done by artist Audie Murray. She is a Métis artist currently, or sorry, 
originally from Alberta. Um, to honor my hands, I have I got tattooed two different designs. The image on the left are, is a floral slash berry plant design, um, reimagined by Audie as well. And that was a design utilized in some of my, my late grandmother's works. And then across my knuckles read uh, my late grandfather's last name before it was anglicized. Uh, it's the first written form of language for the Dene people among other nations across Turtle Island. And so um, those symbols represent his last name, which was originally um, pronounced in Chuse Yuse. Uh, it got anglicized into the surname George. Uh, anglicizing names was a more sinister approach to identity erasure led by the Canadian government and their partnership with Christian missionaries whose goal it was to eradicate Indigenous identity via assimilation processes. So I used tattooing um, on my own body as just another form of, of resistance, but also of survivance uh, and celebration. Skin stitched um, is a performance, <laughs> so I use air quotes. <laughs> Through the process of piercing and stitching, I am, I am reminded of the act of tattooing and its long history and continued presence and current revitalization across Turtle Island. The banning of this art form, along with many other art forms, was just another tactic, like I said, in the erasure of Indigenous identity. I'm most interested in tattooing as Indigenous adornment and as permanent regalia, translating the sacredness and power of stitch work directly onto the body, identifiably wearable art holds immense agency. So this is the artist Stacy Payon, um, also Métis and based in Regina, Saskatchewan. Uh, she gifted me my temple tattoos to honor my eyes. The, they were created using two techniques, hand poke and skin stitch. Um, hand poke is, can be a single needle. This was a single needle. It can be multiple needles um, dipped in ink and then applied like similar to uh, machine tattoo um, piercing the skin and the other technique is skin stitch and it is a needle with a thread the thread is dipped in ink and this, the needle goes directly under the skin surface um, so quite literally stitching through uh, the surface of the skin um, <clears throat> my temple tattoos occurred in front of an audience during my residency at the University of Saskatchewan in 2019. This act um, asserted presence, demanded space for indigeneity, and directly responded to the indigenous erasure that settler institutions are built upon. The suppression of indigenous art forms began early in the 19th century with the arrival of, like I said, of the first Christian missionaries um, in partnership with the Canadian government. Although my work as a jeweler operates differently, than my visual arts practice at times, both are anchored in sovereignty, autonomy, and representation. On the left is an archive photo by the controversial work of Edward Curtis, whose work sets out to document a vanishing race. And on the right, I had the honor of being included in the June 2021 InStyle magazine publication featuring uh, my choker that you see worn here that was titled White Sand and Water. It was worn on first U.S. Indigenous cabinet member, Deb Hallen, Secretary of the Interior. She says in this article in the InStyle magazine that I just wanted to share with you, as a native woman, she knows the importance of interconnectedness and interdependence, especially as we push toward healing our nation and mother earth. Before we sign off, Hallen holds up a photo of a pair of thousand year old yucca fiber shoes that she learned about on her first official trip as secretary to Bears Ears National Monument in Utah in April. She is still clearly taken with their existence. When I saw those shoes, it made me cry because we've always put so much love, thought, and care into the things we've worn, she says. That is something foundational in Native designers. They want to honor their ancestors and the things they made or the designs they had. And for me, that comes through incredibly strong. That says everything. I just wanted to briefly talk about hide tanning as it's so integral to indigenous ways of, of garment making. Um, so it's um, the process of garment making and adorning speaks to the deep love a mother 
and wife had for her family and community. This immense labor of love could last weeks, months, sometimes years, from the prepping of the hide to the adorning of each piece. After stretching, skinning, and scraping an animal's skin, which involves hours or weeks, the hide repeatedly undergoes soaking, wringing, and stretching to soften it. It's then smoked over a fire of rotten wood to tan it, and it gives it that rich golden brown color. Sometimes hides are unsmoked, so they'll remain white and supple. It's even a more rigorous process when you're not smoking a hide um, in that way because every imperfection can then be more clearly visible to the eye, so it takes uh, more time, more precision. It's extraordinary to me that not only was time focused on creating functional utilitarian clothing, but extended to include such an immense act of love through personalizing and adorning. Indigenous modes of making are rooted in these slow fashion processes. This innovation of land as material speaks to indigenous innovation and are examples of the couture creations we've created since time immemorial. Here you can see my grandmother. There's a picture within a picture there when she was um, younger tanning or skinning a hide. And there she was, I want to say maybe in her 70s, the bigger photo. Um, and those are just some examples on the right of just a few of her items that who knows how old some of those are. She created up until she passed away roughly five years ago. She beaded even in her hospital bed. So on the left um, is some work again of my late Setsune's, um, not yet assembled, and what would become a jacket for one of my uncles. And in the photo on the right, that is my late grandfather, uh, Grandpa Eugene, and he wears a fully constructed um, moose hide jacket with her bead work that my grandmother would have completed from beginning to, to end. Um, I have not yet learned how to tan hide. In the meantime, I purchased hides directly from Indigenous artists as a continued and valued art form and a way to support communities directly. Some of my cousins, on the other hand, were mentored by my late grandmother and make their own phenomenal works utilizing their own smoked hide. Um, I also have a uh, mitten that I'd like to pass around as well. Um, that is an example of, it's not that direct mitten that my cousin Giselle on the right is wearing, but it is one of her works. So um, she and my cousin Nicole on the left both were mentored by my grandmother in terms of the construction as well as um, beadwork itself. And you can see the direct relationship between the styles that my grandma made and, and the styles that they've learned. Uh, this work is called The Ties That Bind, and the Textiles Museum was the first to exhibit this work, um, I believe back in 2016? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so back in, I believe it was 2015, um, I was mentored by my grandmother to create this work. It was created with very detailed instruction. <laughs> my grandmother was a perfectionist, and it was very hard at times to work with her. Bless your soul, Grams. Love you. Um, but this would have been done in the same style that she would have used for the majority of her work. So a back beaded panel, um, beaded tops on the toe. Um, this, in this example, you can kind of see where my love of portraiture starts to come through in my beadwork practice. And that was one of the first pieces I ever made with beaded portraiture. Uh, this piece honors my mother and my sister, so really celebrating that uh, the Indigenous feminine again. And the back panels are representative of both uh, the Churchill River, of which my community is um, on the lands of, and then the left panel would be Prince Edward Island, where my sister is currently living and based. However, my my paternal side is all from the Halifax area and, and currently all reside in Ontario now. So uh, celebrating um, where I come from and on both sides of the family. Um, adornment is at the uh, root of my practice. It is a way that I can speak to a powerful narrative um, and I see adornment as vessels and storiers that hold knowledge. Historically, during the suppression of these creative processes, Indigenous people were forced to cover um, their tattoo markings. 
it was seen as a more acceptable way um, to present adornment instead of being literally st st stitched into your body. Um, in this way, jewelry became the regalia. I love that tension, this tension um, created something so in intentional. Adornment becomes layers of protection, healing, and celebrating the body. Through beadwork, um, animal hair tufting, and other historical materials and techniques, I, s I explore indigenous beauty and power, reclamation and sovereignty. This piece you see here is made with porcupine quills. Um, so one way of utilizing quills is, is applied stitch work. Here I was only able to learn one stitch called the zigzag stitch. And um, the goal was to create something that I, in my research, hadn't seen done before. I'd seen portraits done before, um, full body portraits, but none with a lot of detail because it's hard to get super, super tiny stitches when you're working with quill work. And it depends on the, the length and thickness of quills that you can acquire at the time. So uh, my dad was off searching for roadkill for me a lot of the time and <laughs> collecting for me. Um, and I wanted to create an image, this is a self-portrait, titled self-portrait, and I, I basically created these layers of color that I could then follow with um, the stitch work to make it doable. <laughs> um, so one way was to just separate those colors and then start creating in these more um, organic lines, try not, trying not to keep everything too stiff and straight because that's not what quills uh, want to do. So. Um, Quill work requires incredible dexterity, patience, and precision. Um, like I said, of all, there's hundreds of stitches that one can learn. I only had the capacity to learn one. I was I taught myself um, from a book called The Quill Work Companion, I believe. Um, at the time, my grandmother couldn't remember quill work. Uh, she utilized it way back when, when she was a teenager, but uh, with the introduction of seed beads, her practice also changed. Um, so here you can also see that love of portraiture come through. I think this piece is roughly, roughly 12 by 12 inches, somewhere around there, which is quite large for a quill work piece. And it was a ton of labor and I haven't done applied <laughs> stitching <laughs> since with quills. <laughs> Taking a good long break. Um, I'm continually interested in how certain materials speak to history but also challenge the way in which we understand contemporary indigenous bodies. Historical adornment techniques such as quilling and animal hair tufting become a living resistance within my practice and also a way that I can recontextualize. My practice now explores um, the art of animal hair tufting uh, thanks to the guidance and mentorship of Amber Sandy. Uh, here you can see the techniques and materials of caribou hair tufting. Tufting among the Dene people of Canada was common with access to the woodlands caribou. This was a way of adorning prior to the availability of glass beads during um, trade introduced mid 16th century. There are many different types of animal hair applications such as tufting, but also um, techniques that involve uh, embroidery. So moose uh, embroidering with moose hair. I have not learned that technique, but I, I definitely have an interest in learning. So utilizing caribou hair tufting, uh, here's an example of it within my own practice. This is a piece I recently made for a collection titled Convergence. Um, I did the accessories portion within this collection and this piece here honors bear and you can kind of see on the left side all those little sculpted forms there, 3D forms, that's all um, caribou hair tufting. So I sourced my caribou hair from other indigenous artists for the most part, um, pre-dyed, and then I work with it from there. Basically the more hair that you can get into one tuft, the, the stronger it becomes essentially because it's just more condensed. So that would have been the technique used on a lot of outerwear such as mitts and gauntlets um, to protect it from being smushed. They would have been very dense tufts. 
So what you do is you have your surface, whether that's a hide, um, hide surface or leather surface. I've really only worked with, in this piece, I worked with this blue suede, um, but I find that working with uh, a natural fiber material, such as hide, is just a lot easier. Um, it's not as tough, so it's a little bit more porous, yet it holds that thread. So depending on whatever surface you're working with, you basically come up with a needle and thread. I use uh, artificial sinew. Um, it's a little bit more waxy and just holds the stitch better. And you basically make a loop and go back through the surface so you now have this loop. Then you take your caribou hair, you cut a portion of that off into a little bundle. You slip it through that loop that you've created and you pull down underneath on those two threads and you tie it very tightly. What happens is those hairs puff up. Um, there is such thing as having too many hairs or too little. Too many hairs won't create that, that nice puff. And from there you sculpt it. You take little scissors and um, you can create, yeah, little sculpted each one. Each, each tuft is really a, a little miniature sculpture. So you can create bundles of, of stitches, which can form a design, or you can keep them as single stitches and just and cut them on their own. Um, this is some of my past wearable work. This was a piece called But There's No Scar from 2018. Um, this is a series that I feel looking back was a major transition within my practice where fine art and fashion collided and propelled my interest in creating more wearable work. This galaxy of shimmering beads forms a bruise. It speaks to trauma, but more importantly, it is a vessel that holds love, power, and healing. This project involved artist slash author Tennille Campbell slash cousin slash friend. Um, Tennille is kin and hails from English River First Nation. We have collaborated many times since, sharing ourselves to one another through storytelling and love. It has propelled me to think about collaboration in the genealogical sense, but also as art family, and how connection is beyond blood, rather it is reinforced by mutual respect and trust. So this next slide is the image that Tennille took of me wearing the bruise itself. Um, at this point in time, the textile had been purchased by the National Gallery of Canada and was being sent to them. Um, and so I kind of panicked because I knew I wanted to do more with the piece. I just wasn't sure what. And so I took it off of its frame, the frame that you see it stretched to here on the right, um, which is a, uh, that frame was meant to resemble a more traditional apparatus for skinning furs. And so for this image, I took it off, I put it on my body as a cloak. Um, and she photographed it from there. Here it is becomes activated in me putting it on my own body. I can speak more directly to um, embodiment by doing so and living resistance. Um, I find it fitting with this piece to just um, repeat a quote from Quill Christy Peters. I'm not sure if you're familiar with her writing and her work, but she's a phenomenal artist and writer. Uh, this is from a paragraph from one of her writings titled Decolonial Love Letters to Our Body. The anger builds up in you and I from time to time. They talk about reconciliation, but foreclose any spaces that allow us to feel whole. After the residential schools, a generation was created that invented new ways to accept and, broken, and process broken love. Even as small children, we recognize genocidal intent, carefully charting our realities in alignment with the colonial project, shape-shifting and dancing around our parents' broken bodies so that they could feel a little bit more loved, a little more whole, even if that meant sacrificing parts of ourselves that needed that love reflected back to us. Us and Anishinaabe, always inventing technologies to resist, us and Anishinaabe, intelligent power beyond their wildest dreams. They didn't realize that even children are ancestors and homelands and spirits and dreams, that we always have the ability to call on the knowledge we have stored away in our flesh since time immemorial. 
This is the same piece that was in a recent exhibition um, in Montreal. I didn't get a chance to go, um, sadly, but it was made into a vinyl on, as, and installed as a window deco. I enjoy the relationship of it being on a window. For me, it references something both ahead of it and behind it. I look at my body in a context of where I exist in time and how my body and practice is a vessel that carries time. Um, it also carries story and experience in a forward uh, motion. Uh, this was from a body of work, New Age Warriors, which I presented on briefly, or actually quite extensively, I think, in my last talk. So I'm not going to take too, too long talking about it now, but um, this was a body of work that first was formulated as an exhibition and then became runway. Um, so through the deep love that Indigenous garment making signifies, these unconventional plastic armors activate and embody Indigenous power, beauty, and brilliance. You can kind of get a better idea when I say plastic armors in this here. So on the body um, and parts of the headdresses on these uh, that I actually call medallions, even though they're worn on the head. Um, you can see that the, the plastic material that I've used, and I, I don't know if you're familiar with perler beads, mm -hmm. uh, but they're a children's kid craft. They're also called fuse beads, and there's another name as well that I'm forgetting. But um, this is a collection that debuted in 2018. Um, and is currently still on tour. It got picked up for an inter or sorry, a national tour after it was a provincial tour. So I'm really lucky that it's still traveling and communities are getting to see this work, smaller communities as well, all across Canada. For this project, I collaborated with other indigenous artists to fuse traditional indigenous designs with contemporary fu futuristic flair to showcase the diversity and incredible innovation and ingenuity of Indigenous design. Here's a sample uh, with artist Tessa Sayers. Um, it's called My Calling is Culture, and that was her design on the far left that was made into a material, so a textile. And from there, I asked if she wanted to be part of the project, and she did. And so I began kind of the experimental process for each, each work, which is the middle, um, middle image that you see starting to it's starting to form into something but I'm not sure what it's going to be yet and then the image on the right is what it became so filling all those spaces in between um, with other plastic beads and then wrapping it around the body one one aspect of that work that was quite the process to try and figure out was how how can it wrap and not become rigid and the answer was actually quite simple after I realized it probably a month in. Just kidding. I don't know how long it was, but ironing one side and allowing the other side to be the, the part that molds. And so um, the part that's ironed is on the outside. So it allowed that, yeah, malleability of the material. This is just an example of the process. So you buy them usually um, in these big bins of colors and there was no way I realized after experimenting that I was gonna separate these <laughs> for the simple fact that I was getting a deal. Um, so instead I bought the packaged um, colors and instead of using the templates that they use, seen in the middle top row, these kind of peg boards, uh, they were too constricting or restricting for what I wanted to do in the shapes that I wanted to create. So I tacked down um, lint roller sheets onto cookie sheets. <laughs> Sounds very confusing. Um, sticky side up using double-sided tape. And at some points I realized it was too sticky because then it wouldn't peel off. So I had to like, anyways, it was... <laughs> It often at times just looked like a kindergarten classroom, which not knocking kindergarten kids, they're awesome, but it, um, I doubted my process and this project at multiple stages. So <laughs> it did eventually work out. Uh, this is another collaboration with an uh, artist named Alano Adzera. He is based in, I, I wanna say Vancouver now, 
He's Teltan, and this was his design on the left called Birth of a Beaver Clan. And again, I approached Falano and he was eager to be part of the project. And that's what the design on the right is what came from that collaboration. Uh, and that is my sister, Christina Duffy, and her name in the collection was the Churchill Challenger. Uh, her medallion stands for kick-ass auntie. Um, and that is actually glass beads. So portions of this um, collection are such as going back to here, these the chief, the part that says chief and quay, those are glass beads. Um, so I'm kind of just fusing two different materials together. And I did kind of want to trick the audience in a way uh, where they were questioning what was beaded and what wasn't, because from a distance, you, you can't tell at certain points. In 2019, it walked the runway in the Swaya Haute Couture runway in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And from there, it continues to tour both national and international exhibitions and fashion runways. Um, the exhibition that I was speaking of, the national one, ends in 2024. I believe it's in Abbotsford currently, BC. The power of activating works within my practice grew from this body of work. Through its function as living, breathing, wearable art, it pushes the work further beyond limiting and harmful anthropological frameworks. The image on the left is the image that was presented in exhibition. Um, it's quite large. It's, I think, five by seven feet. Um, and those two, they're, they're separated into columns when they're hung in a gallery space. Um, and then the image on the right is the Otapiaki uh, runway show that was in Calgary in 2019. The thread of matriarchy and the indigenous feminine runs through all of my work drawing inspiration from my late Setsune's designs um, in this work titled Miss Chief of Change. This was inspired by a blanket robe design and with using the perler beads again, I have created my grandma's portrait um, in that blanket robe work. Um, also, you can see the similarities with some of the designs used on the back of the muckluck, such as those little kind of grid patterns I bring them up into the torso portion. Um, also those inverted arrows or chevron shapes, um, I included those as well in that design. All inspired by my grandmother's uh, bead work. So this work is titled Unsettle. Unsettle explores themes of power and reclamation through the duality of indigenous presence and erasure. Bound by the deep love that indigenous adornment suggests, this wearable work shifts tactics of erasure into spiritual embodiment and power. For the short film, I was most interested in fashion film, accentuating the movement of the fabrics and textures and materials while creating a narrative. This project was made in collaboration with Patrick Shannon from Inno Native Productions and the robe garment made by my niece, Melanie LeBlanc. Um, I'm just gonna actually play the short film.
So this is uh, my most recent body of work. However, I don't take credit for this as a body of work. It has involved multiple artists and is definitely a community-driven project. It was first formulated for runway and now uh, with the hope of it expanding into an exhibition. So this, will, this work will be built upon um, kind of in reverse order that New Age Warriors happen. So bound by the deep love that Indigenous adornment suggests, this community-driven project converges story, memory, and land to form a collection that celebrates matriarchal love. Together, Melanie LeBlanc, my niece and emerging designer, stitch together our new beginning, one that harnesses the power of our grandmothers in all their ancestral knowledge. So everything for this collection is deeply rooted around kinship, collaboration, and community. Uh, this is my niece here, Melanie. Um, just to speak to our story a little bit more, uh, Melanie was adopted at birth. She is my sister's oldest. And we lost connection with her during her um, adoption story when she was roughly eight years old. And we since, have since reconnected and have been connected for roughly the past 10 years. Um, so over the course of this project, we quite literally are forming our new beginning together, um, being able to work um, through these labors of love and have that connection through this project was deeply emotional at times. Oof, don't cry, don't cry. Um, there's a lot of memory that plays into that relationship. Um, one where my late auntie, uh, who I never got to meet due to a very traumatic and abrupt circumstance was a seamstress, although she would have never said she was. My, my mom talks about my Auntie Louise very fondly and how she was a free spirit and she would jump on the little otter planes out of Patchnack when there was no road um, to get out into the cities where she could buy materials and mingle and socialize and be the free spirit that she was. And she was really connected to garment making, not in the same capacity that my grandmother made, but uh, being a seamstress and, and a designer really herself. So uh, through this link of auntie and niece working together with Melanie, it was a way of picking up that thread that I felt was lost. Oof, haven't shared that before. <laughs> um, so just as our grandmothers, um, sorry, I'm going on to the next one here. Together over the course of two years, we created a 10 look collection that recently debuted in Santa Fe, um, just recently. So it was in August um, that that debuted. And it is now gonna be walking in the Vancouver Indigenous Runway in late November of this year. So if you happen to be in Vancouver area, please do um, come out. It, I think, will be November 30th. Um, so just as our grandmothers created work that was imbued with intention and meaning using slow fashion processes, processes that I define as labors of love, we created a collection inspired by them. Memory and story become major underpinnings for this work as we recall some of our grandmother's favorite colors, materials, and techniques. These works become living vessels on the body, moving present into future as carriers. The images you see here um, are how I included portraiture and also text that references our grandmothers. So the image on the left is the, some of the jewelry I created. Um, earring form, that earring, uh, some, some of the pieces I used actual vintage materials, so the top part of that, the stud part of that earring is an actual vintage earring that I reinvented um, by adding my own work to it. So that's all micro beaded, micro beaded applied beadwork. <laughs> wow. um, so micro beads just meaning super tiny in size. Uh, a lot of the materials that I work with now, especially for portrait work, are vintage and antique beads. They offer the largest array of colors and sizing, whereas if you, there are micro beads made today, contemporary beads, but they are a different shape 
and these are not as uniform. Using vintage beads aren't as uniform, so especially when you're working with portrait work, you're filling these little, little tiny areas and crevices, um, and vintage beads allows you to kind of select the right size to fit into those, so it becomes easier in the end. But I also am just drawn to the colors uh, that are available through vintage beads. Um, the, the beads that I'm using that are vintage are dead stock, so they're no longer created. Uh, that ended at the, roughly during World War I, and so a lot of vintage antique beads, you just, they're done, right? Those are dead stock beads, so you'll, getting your hands on them is, is tough, they're expensive, um, so when you find a good selection of, of collection of beads, um, you tend to stock up on them. So I was in love with this turquoise color and knew that the, color, the collection was going to be saturated in these blue tones so I think I bought like every turquoise bead that this um, small business had we were wondering what I was going to do with it all but mm -hmm. I made good use um, so this is one of the necklaces and earring sets that I made um, this work made space for my own reconnection to land and community through reconnecting via these historical techniques and land-based materials, I was able to reclaim knowledges, knowledges whose forced removal from communities and cultures are being revived. Being hands-on with these materials, learning how to prep and preserve them, ties me to the values of my community where nothing goes to waste and everything has a purpose. The image on the right is a necklace that was made by an uncle um, that was gifted to someone in the family years ago. And the image on the left is kind of my own interpretation of, of that necklace. Um, the hawk talons, actually hawk and owl talons were sourced by my father from um, a roadkill. And so I was able to utilize them in this collection. I started to collect natural materials prior to this collection even happening. So I had gifted um, and traded natural materials from other people. So some of those pieces I was so appreciative of, they came, they came into this collection and I think that's, that's how they were meant to exist. So you'll see a couple more images where I, I utilize some of those, such as this one actually. So <clears throat> collaboration was a massive part of this collection. Reciprocity remained at the forefront of this project, like I said, trading materials, designs, and knowledges. This way of obtaining materials and knowledge dates back to the first intertribal trading networks among our nations. Through this exchange, we bring this way of working in community forward. There were a total of 15 people involved in the creation of, um, in different capacities, some as collaboration artists and others who harvested or traded materials, like I said, and knowledges. Here you see a bare face, bare face? <laughs> bare jaw face accessory. Um, this was created in collaboration with an uh, artist named Sophia Park, who's based in New York City. Um, she did the gold capping, so that's uh, 18 karat gold caps on the canines and some of the molars. Um, and then I added the adornments, the beadwork, fringe, and feather adornments to that. Uh, and the strapping was made by another artist who was a friend of Sophia's in New York City, and together we were able to create um, the balance that I couldn't have done on my own. I, I, I wouldn't have been able to make this kind of strapping and have this structure to the face um, without these knowledges shared by other artists. So that's one example of, of collaboration. Um, her name on Instagram is what you see here. It's actually pronounced Spylon, so if you want to look up Sophia's work, uh, please do. She's extraordinary. This was another work created in collaboration with Raquel Klemp, Kemp, also known as Alajua Fine Arts on Instagram, so please go and follow. Um, this face piece was made in collaboration with her as well as the rings to some extent. The, the actual ring um, finger holder itself is sterling silver and was made by Raquel. The beadwork that you see on both is all done by myself. This is another collaboration with Raquel, and this these were the gifted bison horns I was speaking of, gifted to me by Jennifer Laws uh, a couple years back now. So I was able to prep, um, prep them and polish them and, and learn how to not ruin them. 
And then they went off to Raquel who did shell inlay. Um, that's the floral kind of design that you see there along with some silversmithing and some, I think it's called gold foiling. There might also be um, gold fill components on here as well. And then I did the image of the bison that you see on there. Um, some of the pattern process I just wanted to share briefly. So oftentimes I try to reinvent uh, my grandmother's designs, my late grandmother's designs. I do my very best to not take directly from her. So whenever I can switch something up and just personalize it to make it more of my own, I definitely um, do that when possible. So this is an image of on the left of one of my grandmother's designs that I just kind of mirrored on either side of each other and what came of it was that kind of starfish floral in the center and from there it went on to be um, altered into a graphic that you see on the right that I created um, and then that image was used in the textile material textile itself that became part of the collection so some of the garments are either lined with that material custom made material or um, it, it comes into play in some of the objects i made such as this purse i call it a purse although it's not an actual purse it doesn't hold things it's a framed artwork that's carried as a purse mm -hmm. um, so here in the center the center of it you can see that i tufted that floral and the handle, which you can't really see in this image, was deer antler. And I think you can see it in the next. Deer antler, gold tipped um, by, again, Sophia Park. And then I hung some adornments on the end of each tips of those as well. So a lot of, um, a ton of collaboration and a lot of experimenting because I don't make purses, but I had to learn. <laughs> so it was really interesting in terms of um, learning how to drill into pieces or prep pieces and, and doing the research prior so you're not damaging these because you, you really get one try if you can't replace that uh, material. This is the finale look of the collection. Um, I wanted to focus on the headpiece of this which was made in collaboration with Emily Jan. Emily Jan is um, based in Edmonton now, but I first met Emily through the wild exhibition that Farah curated and we had kept in touch and I, I fell in love with Emily's work um, and invited her onto the project and she was so willing and, and eager and loving and we shared so much about our grandmothers together. Um, so it was, it was a really beautiful collaboration and I got to actually go to Edmonton for the last 10 days to actually work in collaboration with her because keep in mind, this was over the span of a pandemic. So working with other artists was its own struggle. Uh, geographically, of course, like nothing could really happen. So we, the, the trust factor was huge and it turned out I asked the right people. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it, was, it was hard at times, especially with this finale piece, and I'll kind of get into it a little bit more here. Let's flip through. Um, so this is just the beadwork process that I kind of wanted to show you. So starting from my grandmother's portrait on the right, um, and this is kind of how I go about beading portraiture. I print off the image, and then I, I bead on top of it so I can follow the colors. Sometimes I'll just um, slightly edit it to bring pump up the contrast so I can see more clearly where colors are more saturated and that helps with the tonal range and, and things like that. And then it starts to develop a little bit more. It's really exciting. Like my favorite part is always the face and skin because if you don't get that right, you really don't have a great portrait. And so you'll know roughly two days in whether going in the recycle bin or not mm -hmm. but it's always a challenge and I obviously love challenging myself when it comes to beadwork. Uh, this is just a process on the head cap that went under the piece as well as the headpiece itself. 
Uh, the head cap was made in collaboration with the same artist that did the strapping for the bear jaw. Um, like I said, this process was no easy feat. It required four people working remotely to build the structure, adornments, engineering, and uh, for the head cap itself. Shipping and damage were an issue in the final phases of, and required a rebuild and redesign. <clears throat> the head strap was created with the help of Sophia Park and her seamstress friend Destiny, whom I don't know her last name. Uh, the thermoplastic antler and skull were created in Edmonton by Emily Jan, and my work was attached, uh, created in my own studio in Terrace, BC. But like I said, 10 days was, uh, we worked in collaboration in Emily's studio in Edmonton. The transportation to, for, to Santa Fe with this work was its own international journey, of which Emily could speak to more clearly but she was so kind as to drive this across the border for me. Um, we were, after the first time it was damaged in transit via courier, um, art shipping was a non-option to Terrace BC as it was $10,000 for one piece. Um, we'd sent it courier and it, it came to me damaged, so that's when we decided that she needed to make the road trip. <laughs> Um, so when I say this body of work required a team and community, it truly did. This is just one other image of the work. I was honored to work with another artist from my nation, Sky Paul. Um, you may know her from her Instagram business, uh, Running Fox Beats. This is a bag that she had designed on the left in a canvas tote, Masi Cho meaning thank you very much in our Dene language. And I, I saw that image um, and it's, I don't know if you're familiar with the thank you plastic, plastic grocery bags that, I don't know, do you guys want to talk about? <laughs> it's like repeats thank you in English. Um, so she's taken that and obviously um, created it in, in the Dene language and I wanted to see it as uh, a, a couture piece. Um, so much of, well, all of our work, garment making, design work, as Indigenous people utilizing hide, um, they're all couture pieces. So I, I reimagined that her tote right away in this, this extraordinary couture design. So um, I asked Guy if she wanted to be a part of it and she was again eager and willing and happy to be. So in the final bag itself, her actual tote is sewn into that bag in the inside as a pocket. So it was a nice way to include her bag as well. Um, so the middle row of this of this piece is caribou hair tufting. So required many tufts per letter. Um, again, caribou hair was traded with Jennifer Laws and beadwork labor for this, the lazy stitch work, which is, when I say lazy stitch, it's, it's rows of beading, and you can see it on the piece itself. I don't really know how to explain it, but you lay it down in five, seven beads at a time, so it's not applied every, it's not stitched down every two beads. Um, it has a different, a different aesthetic, and that is not a technique that is used by the Dene. It's um, used by other nations, and my friend Kirsten Ryder, who taught me beadwork, is Sue. So I invited her onto the project to do some of the beadwork labor for me. And yeah, that bag, I think we did the math today, roughly. Um, I had asked her how much hours she put in. We think it was anywhere between 200 and 250 hours total time. Um, that could be off a bit, I'm not sure. I quit keeping track on this collection. <laughs> I know that it was two years total for everything. <laughs> this is just the amount of stitch work you can see on the back of the bag. Um, so like men I mentioned before, this work is all about representation and autonomy. We worked with nearly an all indigenous crew from makers to models, to makeup artists, hairstylists, to photographers. This collection is about feeling seen, heard and represented. It's about celebrating our brown bodies and feeling whole. <clears throat> so from runway to, like I said, photographing, there was a few who artists who were non-indigenous and 
we tried our best to, to get that represent, representation as often as we could, but I mean, it's not realistic at times to find the work that you need done um, all by Indigenous people at times.